All right, well, let's, uh, now that we've done that, talk about some of the challenges of these methods. And we touched on these briefly when we were talking about Festinger's cult infiltration study. Now, uh, one of the big challenges is the lack of control in these studies. So you're oftentimes doing them out in the real world. And so just about anything can happen. It's not at all like a laboratory where it's a, uh, a totally controlled environment. Uh, so you might run into some of the same issues that we saw when we were talking about correlational research. I remember with a lot of these studies, it's all observation without any manipulation. Therefore, when you don't have manipulation, it's correlational research, right? And so, um, does anybody remember what the directionality problem and the third variable problem are in the correlational research? <laughs> well, directionality is like if, um, you can, if you conclude that A maybe causes B, you can say that B is the cause of A. Yeah, yeah. So you're measuring two things. And you might want to say that A causes B, but you can't say that for certain because you didn't manipulate A. And that's going to go for observational research. If you're observing two things, and they're happening at about the same time, it's hard to say what direction the causality is running. And then what was the third variable problem? Yeah, you could have some other variable that you didn't even think to observe that's causing all of the things that you are observing. Uh, so those are some big challenges. But in spite of this, uh, observational research can be really useful for uh, falsif trying to falsify strong claims. And you can see this in some of the uh, classic observational research with animals. Uh, so one of the claims about human uniqueness that was around for a long time was that humans are the only animals that use tools. Uh, but then People went out in, into the wild and looked at animals, and you can see some primitive forms of tool use. You can see chimpanzees that strip, uh, strip the bark off of twigs to reveal the sticky sap underneath and use that to fish termites out of a mound. Uh, you can even see uh, otters that will go down to the bottom of a lake and then get a rock and then use that rock to smash a clam open so that it can eat the clam. Uh, and so, again, that falsifies this idea that humans are the only animals that use tools. So, any questions about this? All right. Uh, another big challenge is going to be that observer bias. Uh, like I said, it's important to remember, especially in these types of studies, that researchers are people too. And uh, we can be subject to a number of different biases, including uh, confirmation bias. Has anybody ever heard of confirmation bias before? I see some people nodding over here. Yeah, it's when you're observing the world, you tend to look for evidence that supports your existing beliefs. Like if, uh, so, if you believe in Festinger's study, if they believed that uh, the cult members were going to feel extreme levels of anxiety after the prediction of that flood didn't come true, well then they would be especially active in looking for signs of anxiety. Right? Whereas if they believed that uh, something else would happen, like that uh, people wouldn't be all that anxious, then they might downplay any observations of anxiety that they might make. And so that can be a real problem, but there are some solutions to these issues of observer bias. So uh, one technique that's used is uh, to make use of checklists. Now remember, we've said before that uh, observational, de not observational, but de operational definitions are really important. And so uh, you can make a checklist that contains different elements of the operational definition of your independent and dependent variables for these studies. And then the observers can actually go in and check off whenever they observe some specific type of action. 
Now this is most useful if you recorded the behavior and then you can go in and pause videos and rewind them to actually try to study behavior in depth, but it can be done uh, in the real world too without recordings. Uh, another extraordinarily common solution here is inter-observer reliability. Inter-observer reliability readings. Um, and I know that some of you are familiar with these, especially if you read the, if you were in the Friday lab, uh, we were reading a paper this week and it contained some information on inter-observer re uh, reliability ratings. So what's involved here? What is inter-observer reliability? Making sure, one thing, <clears throat> making sure all observers are trained the same and uh, observed for the same, same behaviors, are asked the same questions in the same way, whatever, that they all have the same level of training and observe and perform in the same way. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the same tool. Um, so instead of just relying on one observer, a lot of these studies will have two or three or four or even more observers. And then they'll see how strongly each observer's ratings correlates with the ratings of other observers. And so you would expect that if there is a strong degree of agreement between the observers, well then that might serve as evidence that what they're saying ha happened actually happened and isn't really a result of bias, unless they were all biased in the same way. Um, but that's one solution. Um, another thing that can really help is to have the observers blind to the hypothesis. And so this is really useful for avoiding that confirmation bias. If they don't know what, the, what to expect to find, and they're just blindly observing data, looking at behaviors, but they don't know what the relationship is supposed to be, then uh, that can help overcome that confirmation bias. That can be kind of tricky, though, getting naive observers. And then finally, uh, another solution here is uh, to do time and event sampling. So it can be really challenging uh, doing observation for any length of time. Um, it, can, it can cause the observers to become tired and then their ratings become less accurate. So with time sampling, uh, the observers will see if a behavior is being performed every so often like every five minutes or every ten minutes. And with event sampling, um, the observers are only measuring a specific type of, of event. So they're not observing all behavior and trying to code everything that their subjects are doing. They're only looking for one or two specific types of behavior. or they might only be interested in a certain type of interaction between two people. And so are there any questions about any of these uh, solutions for observer bias? Now, another big issue is participant reactivity, uh, which we talked about a little bit before. It's when the participants react to uh, the realization that they're being observed, uh, or if the researchers accidentally influence the participants in some way. Now, uh, the best way to get around this is to have unobtrusive observers or to use other types of unobtrusive methods. So, a lot of times researchers will study behaviors that people usually just don't think about. And I have an example of this one that I heard about at a conference last year. Uh, this was a study that was done by uh, a guy named Bob Cialdini, uh, who is a really famous uh, researcher who studies social influence. And what he did was he wanted to come up with a, a clever way to uh, measure voting outcomes. And so uh, he went around and put political flyers on people's cars when they had gone to vote on election day. Now, of course, you can go up and ask people, who did you vote for? Uh, but then you're dealing with all the issues we've talked about, 
that go along with self-report, right? They might not be honest, they might refuse to answer. Uh, and so he would put flyers for the different candidates on these people's cars and measure what did they do with the flyer. Did they pick it up and take it with them, put it in their car? Did they throw it on the ground? Did they throw it away? Uh, and he actually found that that little subtle behavior uh, was a really good predictor of the voting outcome in that particular precinct. Uh, so if people, uh, if more people kept the flyers for a particular candidate, that candidate actually won in that district. And this is after the people had voted, remember, so they're not influencing the voters' behavior in the, boot, in the voting booths because they've already done that. It's, it's done. Uh, but anyway, people usually don't think about that type of action, and then they would just measure how many flyers were thrown away versus how many were taken with the people. So, uh, again, I just thought that was really clever. He's a clever guy. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we've already talked a little bit about the ethics involved here. Uh, people don't know that they're being watched. Uh, usually, you don't get consent in this type of research. Any questions so far? It it really depends. Uh, I mean, it can depend on the human subjects committee at the university. Some human subjects committees are more strict than others and would require you to get consent after the fact. I know that this. Um, that was done in some of the research I've been involved with. Is, uh, we had hidden cameras and uh, we recorded interactions between participants in the lab, which is not naturalistic observation, but it's still observation. And we had to get permission from them afterward. And if they denied permission, then we would have to just go in and delete the video recording. So uh, we essentially didn't keep any records from their uh, participation after that. Yeah. So consent can be uh, gained after the fact, but it, it isn't always. That's a really good question. <laughs>